are you guys today? Good. Good. That was weak. How are you guys today? Great. Awesome. Uh, hello to online listeners as well. We're just glad to have you here in Living Water Yelm. My name is Jeff Morse. Me and my wife, Martha, she's over there. We lead uh, the discipleship program here at Living Water Yelm. And we're just excited to have you guys here and to be a part of this family. If you haven't already felt it, it really is family. If you didn't meet Jeff at the front door out there and didn't already feel family, go meet him before you leave today. Okay? We love you guys and we're glad to have you. Now, I've introduced myself, so why don't you guys take a second and turn around and greet somebody and let them know you're happy to see them. You know, pastor said this a couple times. He said, there's no better feeling than when you say that and you watch everybody greeting each other because it is like family. But I got to pull you back in. Too much of family might be too much, right? <laughs> it, it's, a, it's great to be here this morning. And uh, we exist at, in Living Water Yelm. We exist to make disciples who make disciples. That's, that's the goal of what we do. And if this is your first time here or, you know, you visited a couple times but you never had a chance to connect with us, in the back pocket of the seat in front of you, there is something called a connect card. Jeff's holding it up. That's what it looks like. We would love to connect with you. Uh, fill, fill that information out and let us have a chance to get to know you. We won't spam you, but we will let you know we're family. And let's say you've been here for a while and you have a prayer request. You can do that on there as well. Or let's say you put a prayer request and now you have a praise report. We'd love to hear about that too. And then obviously we believe that you should attend one, serve one, invite one, and disciple one. So if you're part of the family, we would love to have you serve as well. And you can do that on that Connect card too. Let us know what you're interested in, and we'll help get you plugged in here at Living Water. So let's talk about a few things uh, really quick. So how many of you guys were here on Friday night for our first annual, <laughs> our first annual evening to remember? It was a great time. It was a great time of, you can see it up on the, on the screen there of food and fellowship, and also empowering marriages. How many of you guys know that marriage is important, right? And sometimes we don't take time to really dive into how important marriage is, but we did on Friday night, and that was, uh, he did an amazing job there. <laughs> you want to stand up and bow or what? <laughs> I'll give you a point. <laughs> uh, we had a good time. It was a lot of laughs, a lot of fun. Uh, so next year when we have our second annual evening to remember, we'd love to have you join and, and be a part of that. All right. Uh, so there are a few things going on here at Living Water Yelm that I would like to uh, let you guys know about. First one is something called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. How many of you guys went to EHS before? Show of hands in the room. A lot of you. This is a very life-changing session that we go through. It's about eight weeks long. We're starting Monday, February 26th at 6.30 p.m. It'll be right here at Living Water Yelm. If you're interested at all in going and taking the next step of actually becoming emotionally healthy, because I, didn't, I don't know if you knew this, but your emotional healthy spirituality matters if you really want to dig deeper 
into who God is and, and what he has in store for you. We'd love to have you. Uh, go, to, go to livingwater.com forward slash Yelm events, and you can register for that class as well. Uh, next, I'd like to say is one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, me and my wife will be leading something called a New Believers Discipleship class. Starting next Sunday at 9 a.m., we'll be meeting in the cafe out there. And there's been a little confusion or wonder, like, who should attend this or who shouldn't. And here's what I'll say. If you have any questions or you want to dig deeper into any, anything that has to do with faith in Jesus, we'd love to have you there. Um, it's not just for those that just accepted Jesus, but those who want to dig deeper into what that means. And we're going to do that starting next Sunday. It'll be about four weeks long, so we'd love to have you. Same place, go register online. And then after that, I'm going to bring up my friend, Pastor Sam, to announce the next one. Thank you. You're welcome. Guys, how many of you got personal invites from me today for the men's retreat? Okay, so can I just tell you that the enemy loves two things, isolation and excuses. He loves them. He loves to create those things. This is going to be a life-changing retreat that we're going to do. It's just out here at Cascade Camps. The cost is 300 bucks. If you're a high schooler, we'd like to have you there too. It's, it's really important. We believe that God is raising up the men in this church. Well, he's raising up Jeff and I. Uh, <laughs> we believe that God is raising up the men in this church. And one of the things that, that men like to do is have some pretty good excuses for not getting relationships with other men. And you've all heard that iron sharpens iron, right? Well, the fact is right now we're going to lock arms. We're coming into some really good stuff, lots of good discipleship. But I want to see your faces, and I'm going to personally attack you and grab you, and, and I'm going to shake the excuse out of you. So, honestly, we're going to have so much fun. We've got a great speaker, um, one of Pastor Bob's best friends, and now very quickly becoming one of my friends, Chris Pepler, is coming down. You've heard Pastor Bob talk about Chris and their friendship, and he's going to do a man in his call, and he's going to talk about some specific things for men. And I've been asked, too, do I have to be married to go to this? No, you don't. Um, you don't have to be married. You, you, it's going to enhance your relationship with your wife. We're trying to really get the guys where you have resources together. There's only so much Pastor Bob and I can do, but together, as you guys start building relationships, you can do some pretty amazing things. So I can't say enough about this. I just did. But it's on the, our events page. Sign up. Now, there are some guys that are paying the way for other guys. And so if you can only afford half of it or you, if, it, if that's one of the excuses, let us fix that excuse. We're going we're gonna to take care of you so you can go. It'll be Friday night. We'll get there after you eat dinner. We'll have snacks. First session will be Friday night, all day Saturday, and then Sunday morning we'll have breakfast. The cabin's included. The meals are included, and they really put on good food out there. If you've never been to Cascade Camps, their, their cooks are really good. So I'm really excited, and so I'm going to be getting you before you leave. If I didn't get you, I'm going to get you. So... Look, it's, it's really, honestly, let's take the excuse out of it and let's bind together. Good? All right. No pressure, men. All right. And so, like we said, go to that QR code, livingwater.com slash Yelm Events and register. Uh, we also have life groups starting in March uh, if you, if you want to get a, a smaller group and really build relationships. All right. So let's move on to the next thing here. Uh, we are going to give our tithes and offerings. Um, there are three ways to give at Living Water Yelm. You can do it online at livingwateryelm.com forward slash give. The only thing we'd ask, though, is there's one really good campus on there. We want to make sure you click the drop down and change it to Yelm because it's the really good one, right? We love Olympia and we love Lacey, but we would rather give our tithes here, right? So let's make sure we do that. You can text to give as well, or these two gentlemen right here are going to pass around uh, the bags, and you can give here as well. But we're just happy and joyful givers to the Lord. So let's pray. Uh, Father, we surrender all to you, and one of those things we surrender are, is our money. And I just pray, Lord, that whatever we give today would be used to not only reach 
here in this room and this community, but around the world. We just thank you for your graciousness and your love for us, and you truly are worthy. And we just love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you give. Would you guys thank Jeff for just being awesome? I'm so glad that Jeff and Martha are, our, are on our leadership team. I want to just share one more thing. If finances are a challenge, whether it be debt that you're trying to pay off or just trying to figure out a budget, how to save, uh, I want to encourage you to check out Financial Peace University. It's starting a week from Thursday, right here, Thursday night. Jeff Watchman in the back, raise your hand. Jeff is leading that. He has a passion for helping you with your personal finances, and he's really good at it. So I want to encourage you, if you've never been through Financial Peace University and you are finding that finances and financial challenges are beginning to overwhelm you, um, you don't need to carry that overwhelm anymore. You can let Jeff carry it. He's really good at that. <laughs> he will equip you, and you'll find some freedom. So check that out. All right. You guys doing good? It was a great time of worship this morning. So glad you're here. We are in a new series we started last Sunday called How It Ends, A Hopeful Look at the Last Days. And last week we learned that what we think about Jesus' return and how it ends affects how we live for Christ every day. If you missed that message, you can watch it on our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Living Water Yelm, or you can go to livingwater.com slash yelm, and you'll find the YouTube link right there. I stated last week that my prayer for you is that by the end of this series, a few things. That one, you'll feel hopeful, calm, peaceful, secure, and curious. I stated that by the end of this series, that my prayer is that you'll be open to engaging hard questions. You'll be reflective about your own theology, what you believe about God. And you'll follow your curiosity to study deeper. And that you'll know that there are consequences to your theology, or lack thereof. There are different viewpoints and interpretations about the end times, and each has valid arguments. And, and I, I, what you'll hear from me, I hold with my hands open, because I'm like, this is what I understand, reading scripture, but I recognize that there's other viewpoints. And these aren't salvation issues. These are just ways of us understanding what scripture has indicated about the end times. But here's one thing that we all do believe, that we believe that Jesus really is coming back. Amen. Let me say that one more time. We believe that Jesus really is coming back. <laughs> yeah. And I'll throw this out there. If you're, if you're newer to Living Water and you're curious what we do believe, we have a, a thing called Living Water Essentials this Tuesday. Susie and I would love to make dinner for you in our home and invite you to just come and learn what we believe. You can find that online at livingwater.com slash Yelm Events as well. Um, I mean, it's a free dinner. And... Uh, get to hang out with us. So last Sunday, I asked you a question at the end of the message. I said, what questions do you hope to have answered during this sermon series? And your responses were really informative. They were honest and they were even raw. Here's a few of your answers. You, you said, will my family be okay? Will I be okay? A lot of the details sound scary. How not to fear? How do I not feel so scared? How do I know I'm enough? How do I know if I'm good? This morning, we're talking about a moment in the end times that really can bring up fear and confusion and questions about what you and I will experience should we be on the earth during this moment. And it's a moment called the rapture. There's a lot of thoughts, a lot of opinions, and a lot of beliefs about this, this doctrine called the rapture. It's a doctrine that states that Jesus will return to rescue his bride, the church, from the coming wrath. Believers in Jesus Christ will be caught up to meet Jesus in the air, and he will take us to his Father's house in heaven. With the exception of, a, of what's called the post-tribulation rapture view, which I'll explain shortly, all the other views see the rapture as a deliverance from the wrath of God that's described in the book of Revelation chapters 6 to 19 which is known as the tribulation. And you guys have a lot of questions about the rapture. Here are some of yours. Is the rapture pre-tribulation or post? Clarification on the rapture defined as pre or post-millennial in scripture. When does, the when does the rapture happen? 
I, that, that question's fun because I'm like, are you looking for a specific date? Because I can't provide that. <laughs> Will we go through the tribulation as Christians? Will I be good enough to make it to heaven? Even with all my mistakes and sins, I am really trying to be a better person. So really great questions. This morning, let's dig into what the Bible says concerning or what the Bible points to concerning the rapture. Let's talk about fear and how we're to confront it with truth. And then let's get really clear about the gospel and how we can know for certain that we'll be with Jesus either when he, we die or when he comes to get us. Sound good? Rapture, fear, gospel. You pray with me? Gracious God, today as we open your word, we come humbly, we come eager, in fact desperate. Lord, we want you to reveal who you are. We want to see your character and your nature and understand who is this God that your Bible reveals and who we are worshiping. I pray that you would remind us who we are because it's so easy to forget who you've called us to be. And I pray that you would show us Jesus, because he is the one we adore. He is the one that we are seeking. He's the one we're pursuing. And then let your word be a lamp to our feet, a light to our path, so that when we leave here, we leave here different because of time in your word, time in your presence, and time with each other. We pray that in your powerful name, Jesus. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. I'm going to give you three points. They're really questions that I hope we can explore. Here's the first one. What is the rapture? I'm going to give you three scriptures. There are others, but I'm going to give you three scriptures that point to and teach the rapture, this, this idea of believers on the earth being caught up to heaven to meet Jesus in the clouds. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 17 basically describes that moment. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. So this scripture, Paul's writing to a church in, in Thessalonica, and he's describing this moment where Jesus appears to believers on the earth, but Jesus doesn't set foot on the earth. That'll actually happen later when he comes to the earth in his second coming. And the archangel shouts, the trumpet sounds, and every dead believer rises first. People have questions about this. Well, what about people that aren't buried, right? I think God's big enough to figure it out. What if they were, like, blown up in a terrible accident? God will put all the molecules back together. Dead believers will rise. What if they're, like, in the sea and they've been eaten by fish? God's big enough to figure it out. He's going to bring every dead believer. They will rise and meet Jesus in the air. And then every believer that's alive will rise up into the air and meet Jesus in the clouds. And then we'll be with the Lord forever. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52. He says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, meaning we won't all stay dead, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. When the Apostle Paul says this is a mystery, you need to understand that a mystery in the Bible isn't a secret. A secret, secrets are things that we don't know that God reveals, and mysteries are things that the Bible reveals that need investigation to be understood. Something that's transformed from shadow to substance. That's this mystery that he's talking about. And what Paul describes here is this, this change, two changes that happen immediately, like in a, in a twinkling of an eye. It's a change in location, and it's a change in form. And the change in location, when the rapture of the church occurs, we're instantly going to be with Jesus in heaven. So that is our change in location. We're on the earth one moment, we're with Jesus in the clouds, in heaven, with him in the next. The second change is that we're going to be changed in form, and we're going to be given bodies patterned after the resurrection body of Christ that will make us suitable for being in the Lord's presence in heaven. You read the Gospels, and then you read post-Christ's resurrection in the book of Acts. He appears. He appeared actually up to 500 people, saw Jesus alive in his resurrection body. You remember, you've, you've read some of these accounts. He's walking through walls. 
He still is, has a human body, but it's supernatural in form. It is this resurrected body. So we will have a resurrected body. We'll have a body that's free of sin, free of aging. Come on, somebody. Free of death. We'll go from having mortal, sin, corruptible flesh and blood bodies to having supernatural, immortal, incorruptible bodies capable of an e eternal existence. So if you kind of like look in the mirror this morning, and you're like, this body, it is sad. I got good news. You got a new one coming. Anybody excited about that? Okay. Come, Lord Jesus. Get me a new body. One with abs and not... And, a six-pack and not a keg. Come on. <laughs> That's not in my notes. <laughs> John 14, 3. These are Jesus' words. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. I'm going to share something so cool with you. Here's the thing. Jesus made us a promise that when he was on the earth the first time, that he would go to heaven and prepare a place for us, and then he would come back to, and take us to be with him. This is the coolest thing. It's a picture of an ancient Jewish wedding practice. Everything that Jesus is setting up and where we are right now is this picture of a Jewish wedding practice. Let me break it down for you. Okay, let me just talk about Jewish weddings, kind of the ancient Jewish wedding practice. The first step in a Jewish marriage was betrothal. Betrothal involved the establishment of a marriage covenant. And by Jesus' time, it was usual, usual for such a covenant to be established as the result of the prospective bridegroom taking the initiative. The guy said, went to the girl and actually went to her father, the prospective, and he would take the initiative. He would travel from his father's house to the home of the prospective bride. And there he would negotiate with the father of the young woman to, to determine the price, which was called a mohar. It was like a dowry that he must pay to purchase his bride. You think about that, you go like, well, that's really yuck. Well, if you think about it, back in those days, you know, this father is losing one of the members of his family who produces work, might be working on the farm, on the, in, you know, whatever the production is. So, like, there's a cost to this father losing his daughter. So this mohar was basically a way of saying, like, I recognize that there is a cost uh, in your daughter leaving your family. So I'm, I'm acknowledging that with this price. So that's the reason for this mohar. Once the bridegroom paid the purchase price, the marriage covenant was thereby established, and the young man and woman were, were, were regarded to be husband and wife, but they didn't live together or consummate the marriage. So they're husband and wife, but they're not together. From that moment on, the bride was declared to be consecrated or sanctified, and set apart exclusively for her bridegroom. As a symbol of the covenant relationship that had been established, the groom and bride would drink from a cup of wine over which a betrothal benediction had been pronounced. After the marriage covenant had been established, the groom would leave the home of the bride and return to his father's house. And there he would remain separate from his bride for a period of 12 months. Now you're like going like, wait, they're married, but now they're going to be separated for a year? Yeah, this is an ancient Jewish wedding practice. This period of separation gave the bride time to gather all of the things, her clothes, her household linen, other belongings collected by a bride for her marriage and prepare for married life. The groom occupied himself with the preparation of living accommodations in his father's house to which he could bring his bride. Think of that like, I'm going to go to my father's house and I'm going to build us a room attached to dad's house that'll be ours. Like, that would be the practice. I'm going to spend that year getting our place ready. At the end of the period of separation, the groom would come to take his bride to live with him. This is so cool. Check this out. The taking of the bride usually took place at night. The groom, best man, and other male escorts would leave the groom's father's house and conduct a torchlight procession to the home of the bride. Although the bride was expecting her groom to come for her, she did not know the exact time of his coming. She had to be ready and watching. The groom's arrival would be preceded by a shout. This shout would forewarn the bride to be prepared for the coming of the groom. After the groom received his bride together with her female attendants, the enlarged wedding party would return from the bride's home and go to the groom's father's house. 
Upon arrival there, the wedding party would find that all the other wedding guests had assembled already. Do you see this? This is a picture. Jesus' return for his church, his bride, is a complete picture of the Jewish marriage custom. Let me break it down for you in case you can't see all the points. Jesus, our bridegroom, left his father's house to come to earth, the home of his prospective bride, the church, 2,000 years ago. Jesus established his new covenant with his church when he celebrated the Last Supper, when he took communion, wine, and the unleavened bread with his disciples. Jesus paid a price to purchase his bride, the church. What was that price? The price that he paid was his own blood on the cross. After he rose from the grave, Jesus left the earth, the home of the church, his bride, and returned to his father's house in heaven. We, the church, have been betrothed to Jesus, but living separate for 2,000 years, waiting for our bridegroom to come for us. We don't know when he's coming, but we are watching and waiting for that shout. His return for us is the rapture. Is that a crazy cool picture or what? Am I the only one who gets excited seeing that? I'm like, that is cool. Where does this word rapture come from? Because you might read your Bible and say, I don't see the word rapture anywhere in my Bible. You do, you just don't see it in English. The word, the Greek word in Thessalonians 4.17, let me read it again. We who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That Greek word translated English, caught up, is harpazo. Everybody say harpazo. That's Greek. When the New Testament which was written in Greek, primarily, when it was translated into Latin, that translation was called the Latin Vulgate. And the Latin word, the, the Greek word harpazo, was translated into Latin, and that Latin word was rapturo, which is where we get the English word rapture. So you have harpazo translated into Latin, which is rapturo. The, rap, the Latin word rapturo was translated in English rapture. So that's where the word comes from. There's three different views about the rapture, and I'll, I'll share two of them in detail. There's a pre-tribulation rapture view, a post-tribulation rapture view, and then a mid-tribulation rapture view, which is really a minor view, which we won't explore because it just is a kind of a variance of, of pre. Um, so let's break this down. Pre-tribulation rapture, this view, believes that the church will not be present on earth during the tribulation. What is that word, tribulation? It's a time of God's wrath being poured out on an unbelieving, rebellious population, and it's a time of unprecedented persecution upon those who do choose to follow Christ during this time period. This view is based on the promises in God's word that the church will be delivered from God's wrath. Jesus rescues us from the coming wrath he took the wrath of God on the cross so that we won't. Let me give you some scriptures that explain this in a little more detail and specifically back this up. 1 Thessalonians 5.9. Paul, again, writing to the church in Thessalonica. For God did not point us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1.10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Romans 5, 9. Paul writing to the church in Rome. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Do you see a pattern? What you're seeing in the New Testament is that this promise that Jesus rescues us from this coming wrath. Okay? Here's another reality. Is that in the book of Revelation the last book in your Bible, the word for church, the Greek word is ekklesia. And ekklesia is mentioned 19 times in Revelation chapters 1 through 3. And then not again until chapter 22. So you see the church 19 times, chapters 1, 2, and 3, and then you skip all the way to chapter 22 before you see the word church ever again. And during the tribulation upon the earth, chapters 6 to 19, you know how many times the church is mentioned? Zero. Zero times. 
Instead, the church is portrayed as being in heaven with Christ in chapter 4, which we just sang those words this morning in our worship time. And you see, and, it's re- and the church is represented by those 24 elders. And then you see the church returning with Christ in chapter 19, verses 8 and 14, where they're clothed in fine linen. So the church is not, as I, as I understand scripture and many others, the church is not on the earth during that time of tribulation. The church is in heaven with Jesus and then returning to the earth with him in chapter 19 of Revelation. So for the pre-tribulation rapture believer, all biblical evidence points to one thing, the rapture is real. Now there's a post-tribulation rapture view. Now this view believes that the church will be present on the earth during the tribulation and must pass through the time of trouble before we're taken to heaven with Jesus. Now, there's a variety of arguments for this post-tribulation view. I think one of the more compelling ones is that the church has always experienced trials and tribulation and suffering. And so this view would say that because the church has always been in this time of tribulation and suffering, therefore the great tribulation has in large measure already been fulfilled. They would say the church has already been going through the tribulation, so we're just going to go right up to heaven. We're not going to be... There, the tribulation has happened or, or has occurred. Here's some examples of that tribulation and suffering that you can look at right now. And I, think it's really, I think it's really valuable. I think it's worthwhile for us to have this awareness. Presently, one in seven Christians worldwide are persecuted for their faith. That's 365 or more million of our brothers and sisters that are being persecuted right now for believing in Jesus. This ga- kind of gathering... This is not possible for 365 million, or it's very, very dangerous. One in five Christians are persecuted in Africa. Two in five Christians are persecuted in Asia. If you're a Christian living in North Korea, Somalia, Libya, or Nigeria, worshiping Jesus puts you at risk of arrest, attack, abduction, violence, and even murder. And for these Christians, they're already living in tribulation. But here's the thing. Jesus delineated the difference between Christians facing suffering and trials in this world and unbelievers enduring the wrath of God. Two really different things. John 16, 33. This is Jesus' words. He says, See, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And then Jesus' words in Revelation 3.10, speaking to the church in Philadelphia, he says, Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. So he says, in this world, you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trials. You're going to have suffering. You're going to have tribulation in this world. Is there anybody here that would like to attest to that? Yes, I have experienced some trials and trouble and suffering in this world. Jesus says, take heart, I've overcome this world. And then he says to the church, he says, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. So he says, you're going to have trials and suffering in this world, but then there's a moment where there's going to be tribulation coming on the entire world, and I'm going to keep you from that moment. And the Apostle Paul explains who the recipients of God's wrath will be. Romans 2.8, but for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. Does that sound to you like the church? It doesn't to me. If, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are not somebody who is self-seeking and who rejects the truth and follows evil. And so those are the ones who are going to experience the wrath and anger. Is this making sense to anybody? Okay, I see like four people nodding. That's great. Good. No, you're doing better than that. Okay. <laughs> Let me give you another word. Imminence. Imminence. If something is imminent, it's impending. It's about to happen at any time. And the rapture is imminent. That's a word, important word to use to understand when you're talking about the rapture of the church. Because the rapture is what's called a signless event. A signless event. Here's two scriptures, Jesus' words explaining this. 
Matthew 24, 42. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Matthew 25, 13. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Refer back to that Jewish wedding practice. The bride doesn't know when the groom's coming. Knows it's going to be about a year, but doesn't know the day or the hour, right? Doesn't know when her groom is going to come for her. That's what Jesus is saying to us. Keep watch because you don't know the day or the hour that, I, that your Lord will come. So Jesus is talking about an event where nothing we could detect precedes that event. Nothing that we could calculate will help us plot out, plot that event out. It's completely imminent. It must be at any moment. There's no signage. Nothing else is involved. We're not looking for signs of the rapture. We're looking for Jesus himself. So the rapture could happen before I finish this sentence. It didn't. <laughs> but as one of my mentors like, like to say, but there is some day, some time, that some sentence will be interrupted by Jesus. I'm like, yes. So throughout the New Testament, this perpetual anticipation for the imminent rapture return of Jesus was regularly on the minds of the early church. So those first century Christians, they were like, Jesus could be coming back anytime. It was imminent to them. They probably did not anticipate it being 2,000 years, but in that early church, they were thinking Jesus could come anytime. And that's why we're told in Scripture repeatedly to look for and to hope for the appearing of Christ at the rapture. Let me give you three of them. 1 Corinthians 1, 7, as you eagerly await the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for a Savior. And Titus 2.13, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why the rapture is referred to as the blessed hope, that verse out of Titus, that we are eagerly waiting for the appearing of God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, to come and appear to us who are waiting for him on the earth. Okay, there's a question that many of you asked last week, and you asked, how do I know if I'm good? Will I be good enough to make it to heaven? And to answer that, you and I need to understand the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So here's my second question that I want to address is, what is the gospel? Here's the, here's the reality. Is we deserve wrath. We have a sin nature in us, inherited because of creation, and when Adam and Eve rebelled against God, the fall, that sin nature has, through thousands of years, we inherited it. It's in our spiritual DNA. We have this nature in us that wants to go its own way and rebel from God. Has anybody here ever experienced their sin nature wanting to go your own way and rebel from God? There's some honest people in the room. Thank you. I'll be the first to raise my hand. There are times when I, I sense God saying, trust me. And I'm like, I don't want to trust you. I want to do it my way because this isn't working for me. That sin nature is what causes us to rebel. But because of God's great love for us, we're saved from God's wrath. We're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. It's a gift from God. It's not because of what we do or need to do. This is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So we're not saved by being good enough. We're not saved by doing all the right things. You're not saved by coming to church and checking the box. You're not saved by reading the Bible enough times. None of that. In fact, Scripture says all of your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. And the original word for that is a really ugly word. But it's God saying, like, it's, no, none of that. It's because of Jesus and what he did on the cross that makes you good that makes you worthwhile, makes you worthy. It's because of Jesus who is good. It was Jesus who is sinless. Let me explain it further with Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. Let me read this. Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and sins. We're dead. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That's the enemy of our souls, Satan. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. 
That's what you just raised your hand to a minute ago. You, yep, that was me. Gratifying the craving of my flesh and following my own desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Scripture says we deserve wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show his incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So that scripture tells you how you used to live before Christ saved you. It tells you what you deserve. We deserve wrath. And it says that because of God's great love for us, that's why he sent Jesus. And he saved us. And he seated us with Christ in heaven. There's a reality right now that we are seated with Christ in heaven, but yet we're still here on the earth. And there will be a day when that reality will be true in its greatest form. We'll be with Christ in heaven, seated with him. And we aren't saved by what we do. That's called works. And there are, there are churches that teach a works-based religion where you're only able to get to heaven if you do all the right things. That's not what we believe. We believe that we are saved by grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And we believe, that we believe that we're saved by grace through faith, belief in Jesus. Is this helping anybody? John 3, 36, Jesus' own words. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. So you ask the question, well, what happens to those people that are left behind? Well, this is what happens. This is what happens to those who do not believe and reject the free gift that God has made available to us. This is what happens to those who are not raptured to heaven. God's wrath remains on them. They will face the tribulation, which we'll discuss next Sunday. And I'll just say, it's not a great picture. Revelation 6 to 19. Not a great time to be alive on the earth. But let me give you an analogy. You have a billion dollars in debt. A billion dollars in debt. And you will never be able to pay that debt in your lifetime. And because of that debt, you are looking at a prison sentence, a lifelong prison sentence for that debt. But somebody comes along and offers to pay your debt in full. All you have to do is to receive their free gift and believe that their offer is real. And if you accept their gift, your debt is paid in full and you're free from prison. But if you do not accept that gift, and it is completely your choice, Nobody's forcing you to accept this free gift. It's your choice. But if you do not accept that gift, you still have the debt and you still face prison. Jesus is the one who paid that debt. Jesus is the one who says, I paid it in full. It's already paid. I paid it at the cross. The debt that you owe, I paid at Calvary. I paid it on the cross and I paid it with the most precious commodity this earth has ever seen my blood. That's how your debt is paid. I want to just take a minute right now and, and just give an opportunity, because there may be somebody, I don't know everybody's story, there may be somebody who just heard the gospel for the first time in their life. You might be watching online, you might be in the room, and you like, the coin dropped in the slot, and you're like, oh, I get it. And right now, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to that and just say, Jesus, I need you. I remember the time I was actually at a funeral when I heard the gospel for the first time. I was raised in the church. I was raised in a United Methodist church. Love United Methodist church, but I, just, I never responded to Jesus until I was 20. And I was at a funeral, and I heard the gospel. Pastor read John 3, 16 and 17, and I was like, I get it. Coin dropped in the slot. Light bulb turned on. I'm like, I need Jesus. It was that night I just asked Jesus to come into my heart, be my Lord and my Savior, and I wanted to follow him. Just close your eyes for a minute. Is there anybody right now 
who would just say, yeah, that, that's me. I, I, I'm going to choose to follow Jesus right now. Don't want to be here. <laughs> I don't want to get left behind, but that's secondary. I want Jesus. I want to follow him. I want him to be my Lord and Savior. I want him to pay my debt. I need Jesus. If that's you, just throw a hand in the air so I can pray for you. Anybody at all? Okay, thank you. Okay, second question. There's some people in the room. I just, I suspect this is real. Some people in the room that you've, you've just drifted away from what you, you know, what you know about Jesus. You're hearing words and you're like going, I know this, but I've just drifted away. I don't even know why I'm here this morning. Lies are circulating in your head. You don't belong here. You're too far from God. You're not worthy. Those are lies from the pit of hell. And right now, Jesus is saying, come back. Come home to me. Come back to your first love. I miss you. I want you. And today, the spirit of the living God is drawing you back into God's arms. And all you have to do is say, yes, please. I want to come home. If that's you, would you shoot your hand in the air so I can pray for you? You want to come home? Anybody at all? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Gracious God, you saw these hands, people coming to you for the first time, people coming home to you right now. Jesus, would you just, let's say this together, just as a prayer, specifically for those who just expressed this with their hands, but we'll do it together. Jesus, I'm coming home to you. Be my Lord and my Savior. I choose to follow you today. I want you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It's mm, good. God's good, amen? Yeah. Right now there's a party in heaven. People, angels are, are dancing because of the decision you just made. There's a really good next step, a couple of them. One is if you don't own a Bible, we've got free ones here for you and they're yours to take, you don't even have to bring them back. The second thing is, as you heard Jeff and Martha talk about this new believers course that's starting next Sunday, I encourage you to check it out. Even just go to the first one, 9 a.m. next Sunday in the cafe. If you don't like it, you get your money returned. It's free, <laughs> but <laughs> it will really help you. Okay, last point, and then we're going to take some time together. How do I handle fear? Because that was another question that came up. This is scary stuff. How do I deal with that? 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. Your Bible might say self-discipline or sound mind. You know, what Paul is writing, writing about here, he's writing to Timothy, a young pastor who's overwhelmed and afraid. And he's saying, look, the spirit of the living God is in you. He resides in you, and he's giving you power, love, and self-discipline. Power is that enablement to do what God requires because you're never asked to do anything beyond what God gives you the strength and ability to accomplish. You will continually be asked to do things that are, out, that are beyond your ability but never beyond God's ability. Love, love is expressed first to God and then to others. It's that distinguishing quality of Christians. You hopefully experienced it today. And then there's the self-discipline which is that careful, sensible thinking that the Holy Spirit gives us the power to have. The ability to, to think clearly with wisdom and understanding. Because see, fear is the driving force in society today. It's the main subject of the evening news, the underlying premise of marketing and advertising. And what does fear do? It spawns confused thinking, irrationalities and misunderstanding. Thoughts and speculations swirl in our minds when fear enters. And that's why Christ calls us to healthy, orderly thought processes. And the way we do that is we identify we, we acknowledge the fear, right? We, and then we confront it. We identify the lie that's behind that fear, and then we replace it with the truth. Let me give you some truth. Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Joshua 1.9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. 2 Corinthians 10.5, 
We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Isaiah 26.3, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Confront the fear, identify the lie, and replace it with the truth in God's word. Here's the bottom line this morning. You guys have been very patient. There's a lot coming at you today. But here's the bottom line that I hope you take with you. Jesus rescues us from the coming wrath. He took the wrath of God on the cross so that we won't. I want to give us some time. You heard a lot. I want you to talk about this with some people around you. I want us to get into a small group of about two or three others. And I'm going to give you three questions. This is, this is a get to, not a have to. If you want to race out of here, you're welcome to. But, I mean, there's big people at the door that'll, you know, no, there's not. I want you to... Get with some other people because even you articulating what you are thinking and feeling is going to help somebody else feel like, oh, I'm normal because I'm thinking those things too. I, I don't understand everything. What, how, what does this mean? So here's the three questions. What did you hear this morning that was most impactful? It could be anything. It doesn't have to be from this message. How would you explain the gospel to someone? You could talk a lot, a long time on that. But how would you explain the gospel in its simplest form? And then what truth will you hold on to when you're facing fear? All right, so turn, find some people maybe you don't know, two or three others, and just talk about those questions, and I'll come up right at the end of our service, and uh, we'll pray, and I'll let you go. Okay? Sound good? All right.
All right. Sorry to interrupt, but I want to encourage you to continue talking after I pray. I love, 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 love hearing this, the conversations. I know it's challenging for some people, especially if maybe you're here for the first time, you're like, what, what, what? But way to go. Good job. You know, there's some people that, that are in the kingdom of heaven today because they decided to follow Jesus. And that, my heart is happy, but man, God's heart is bursting. I just want to encourage you, if you made that decision today, don't just run out of here. Our prayer team is going to be right up here at the front. Sam and I will be available. I just want you to, I want you to tell somebody what you did today. Because it's the word, it is, it is confessing with your mouth. It's, Romans 10 says, believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. So I want you to tell somebody the decision you made. Whether it was coming back to Jesus or coming to him for the first time. Don't leave here without just going up to somebody. They're safe people. They're great people. And just go up and say, I said yes to Jesus today. Okay? Will you do that? Not looking at you. Will you do that? <laughs> would, would you stand? Gracious God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word that changes us. Thank you for conversation with each other. Thank you for community that you're developing. Thank you for your presence. This week, I pray that you would keep us in perfect peace. The Hebrew is shalom, shalom, perfect peace. Because our hearts are steadfast and our minds are set on you. So I pray peace. Where there has been fear, may it be wiped away because of the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guarding our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And until that day that you call us home or you return to get us, Jesus, our hearts long for you, and we wait eagerly for you. We love you, and we pray this all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Take some time, visit with some people, come talk to the prayer team, get some prayer. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless you.